Good evening and welcome to the first day of Wild Agencies. So uh, those of you that made it through finance, congratulations. <laughs> Y'all made it. <laughs> okay. So that's good. I'm glad everybody made it through. Uh, finance can definitely be a, a long one, but uh, in regards to agencies, we're rolling along. Okay. Now agencies can be like finance in some situations. Um, but I will tell you this, agencies is the second hardest part of the exam. Second hardest, okay? So what we're gonna do is, there's a lot of content that we're gonna cover, a lot of content. Um, and your book is in the slide, okay? So those of you that are ending up reading through this or want to know where your book is, your book is in the slot or in the in Google Classroom. Okay, you do not have to purchase this book, uh, but I'm going to tell you, even with the book, probably my lecture will make a lot more sense than reading. Okay, because if you, a lot of people that read the book, they're like, "What did I just read?" All right. So I'm going to go through this and give you a lot of examples. Now the classes may end up lasting the entire two hours. So I may go a little bit over. But the reason I'm saying that is that this is the second hardest part of the entire course. Okay? So we started easy and worked our way forward. I think it's good. I think it's going to get dark here in a minute. So what we're going to end up doing here is we're going to go ahead and we're going to start dealing with the agency concepts. Okay? So Real quick, before I jump into this, those of you uh, that are brand new to this, uh, if you've got questions, uh, all I got to tell everybody else, just unmute yourself and say, I've got a question, and uh, and then I'll take your question. So if as I'm going through things, you're confused, do not hesitate to interact, okay? You're more than welcome to, to be part of it. Even though you're not physically in the classroom, you're still here tonight with everybody else, okay? And, we love the interaction. Now, the one thing that y'all are going to love about this class is at the end of each chapter, if we have time, we have discussion questions. They're not going to be the same as online. They're a little bit different. We're going to talk about them if we have time. Okay? All right. So, the very first thing we're going to talk about is what is agency? What exactly is agency? Well, here's what it is. Agency is basically me representing somebody else. So, say that I'm representing Leela in a transaction. Miss Leela in that situation is my client. Therefore, Miss Leela, I have to look out for her interest, not my interest. Now, Mr. Eugene, I got a question for you. What if me and Miss Leela, okay, I first, before I met Miss Leela, I go find this beautiful house that Miss Davenport owns, and I want her house. And she's currently selling it for five hundred thousand, and it's worth seven hundred thousand. And I love her house, but when I come back from seeing it, Miss Leela comes in, she signs a buyer representation with me, and she says, "I want to go see Miss Davenport's house." Do I have to end up? Do I have to disclose to Miss Leela that I'm interested in that same house? What do you think? Well, you're representing her, so. Really, uh, and you want it yourself, right? Yep, I want to buy it too. Well, she comes first. Miss Leela comes first. Right. Not Justin. Right. Miss Leela. So in that situation is, even though I want it, I have to do one of two things. I have to end up saying, Miss Leela, I want to purchase this house, and since I want to purchase it, Mr. Travis, I'm going to refer Miss Leela to you. And Miss Leela, don't tell me anything about the property, because if I know anything, then I can't even bid on Miss Davenport's house because now it's undue advantage. I have an unfair advantage if I find out how much Leela can spend. Because if she tells me she has only 500000 then all I know to do is I'm going to do $501, $500,001, because I already know I can beat her. Okay? So in that situation, agency is what we're going to talk about is basically, if you want to put down here, it's representing other people. 
Okay. Now, the Real Estate License Act, the TREC rules, and uh, any of the laws that govern licensing conduct, all of these things are going to go together. Now, what these are all coming into is this situation, is that in this particular situation, I have to end up, number one, my duty is going to end up being to my client, no matter who it is. No matter what it is, my duty as a real estate agent is to my client. Just like as a professor. See, here's the thing about me. I'm a real estate broker, but guess what? I'm also a professor. Okay, I have my own school and I teach too. Okay. So from eight to five, my duty is to who? My clients and my agents. Okay. Now, when I am practicing, say Miss Davenport, say that she when she finishes the classes, she wants to go to Keller Williams. Okay. I cannot Hold a, hold a grudge against her because she's going to KW. My job is I have to put on multiple hats, if you see what I'm saying. So no matter what it is, when I'm doing my work, eight to five, my client's my agent. But when I'm in here, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you're going. I have people that goes all over the place, okay? The thing is, though, is that this is how you have to look at it. You have to treat everybody the same no matter what. You can't show favoritism. You can't do that kind of stuff. Everybody has a fair right because I'm going to tell you, no matter where you go to, if Miss Davenport goes to Keller Williams, Mr. Eugene, you go to Century 21, and Travis ends up going to Remax, we still are all going to work together. We're still all going to be in this business together. So I'd rather have good rapport with you than ending up have a hate love hate relationship. Okay. So in these situations, is just like with that, I have to have multiple hats. Well, when you're in real estate, when you're not in a contract. So say in this situation, Ms. Sheldon comes into me, to my office, and she starts inquiring about Aiden, your listing. When Ms. Sheldon walks into my office, is Ms. Sheldon really represented at that time? No, what is she at that time? What do you call a person that walks into Walmart to go shopping? A customer. So at that point, when Sheldon walks in here to just look, Sheldon's a customer. The minute that Sheldon signs a representation agreement with me, what does she now become? A client. At that point, she's a client. So there are certain laws that rule, uh, govern the licensee's conduct. Certain rules, and we're going to talk about those. There's also in this situation, we're going to talk about protecting the interests of agents, clients, and principals. You're going to learn about clients and principals a lot in this class. There's also roles that people play in agency relationships, such as client or customer. We're also going to talk about the why of studying and the relationships between the principal and the agents. This kind of gives you a basic overview of what we're going to talk about this evening. Okay. Now, there are two classifications of license holders. Okay. And every person always asks me this every single semester. I'm going to see if Mr. Uh, Travis can answer this for me. Mr. Travis, can you hold both a salesperson's license and be a real estate broker at the same time? Can you have like an agent license? Can I, can I hold a real estate, a salesperson, and a broker at the same time? Can I be both of them at one time? No, you can't. No, you can't. You can only be one or the other. Okay? So, a broker is the one that sponsors a salesperson. So when you get your real estate license, you have to be sponsored by a real estate broker. And you have to be sponsored by that broker for out of the past five years, you had to been active for four. Okay, that's very key. So Mr. Eugene, when you get your license, you have to for at least out of the past five, four of them, you must have been fully active in practice. Now, let me ask you this, Mr. Eugene, what happens if you work two, you take off one, and then you work two more? Have you met your four-year requirement? No, they're not consistent. Well, they don't have to be consecutive. Oh, really? But out of five, you were two, you're off one, there's two, so you did have enough. Now, what happens if you were off, you work two, you're off two, and then you work two? Now what happens? Uh, you wait up. Well, it depends. Depends on how you're running the number, because this one may not work. So you may not have enough. 
you may only have three. Do you see what I'm saying? So you got to watch how you're running these. A lot of real estate agents, salespeople, they get in this business and they end up, they'll work one or two years, they get out, they'll be out of it two or three years and then they get back in it. And then they're like, okay, well, I had four years, so I'm going to go sit for my broker's exam. Sorry to tell you, guess what? Doesn't happen. Doesn't work. Okay. So a salesperson is associated with a broker. Okay. And the agent must be sponsored by a broker. So I have to sponsor all of you in this hypothetical. Okay. Now I, however, am actually the agent for the seller or the buyer or the landlord. So when say, uh, Mr. Travis, you wrote up a contract last night. Did you, uh, did you sign that contract, Mr. Travis, on the representation agreement? Yes. Yes, you did. Okay. But does that mean you're a broker? No. No, what's that mean? I'm an agent of the agent. You're I'm basically associate. my associate. Yeah, I'm associate mm -hmm. with the broker. So because you're my associate, you can sign on my behalf. Mm -hmm. Because when me and you, when I sponsor you, I give you certain delegated duties that you can do on my behalf. Because do you think, and the question always comes in, what if Aiden had, or if, let's just put it this way. What if down in Galveston, Travis, you're there, Aiden, you're in Amarillo. Do you think that your broker could sign all those agreements? Do uh, you think I'd make it, would, how, how productive would it be for me to have to drive out down to Galveston, sign, drive to Amarillo, sign? Man, I'd be tired, wouldn't I? <laughs> okay. So, yeah, <laughs> I'd, be, I'd be needing a Prius on that one to get around. So in the situation is my agents have certain duties to sign on my behalf. Do you like kind of, uh, Ms. Davenport, you probably in, in your previous job, you probably were allowed to do certain signs or certain initials or stuff. That is a delegated, they're giving that out for that person to do what they need to do. Okay. So a salesperson, of course, is going to be associated with a licensed broker and they're always an agent of the sponsoring broker. They're always an agent, but the broker is actually the agent of the seller, buyer, or the landlord. Okay. You already see an issue here. What's the issue? You're always an agent of the broker, but the broker is the agent of these people. So you very quickly how this can get very confusing very quickly. Okay. Because what they'll give you is a hypothetical, like Mr. Travis, Mr. Travis goes and meets with his client, AB and he signs the representation form. Therefore, Travis is the agent of those clients, true or false? False, you are. False, because I am. Just because you sign does not mean you're the agent, even though you're called a what? Agent. A real estate agent. You see what I'm saying? So you got to get this clear, and that I spend time on this because this throws everybody, everybody. So when we're talking about representations, if you want to make it easy here, if we're talking about representing people outside of the firm, it's the broker. Okay. If we're talking about representations inside the firm. It's the agent and the broker. Okay. So if like I sponsor Stefan, Stefan and I, he has certain duties. He's an agent of mine, but Stefan also can, in some situations, I may be able to assist him in certain things. Okay. But key word here is that the broker is always responsible. Now the broker works for clients, but with customers. And you may want to highlight, bold, quotation, all of that one, okay? The broker works for clients, but with customers. So for example, when you go into Walmart, you go into Target. So Amy, when you walk into Target, you walk in the door, and the Target sends a representative from their main corporate office to come in and walk you around the store, right? I wish. Is that, is that how it works? No. Why don't they do that? Because you're a what? Customer. Your customer. So I've got that money. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Your customer. That you're not a you're not represented by Target. You are a customer walking into their their store. Okay. It's just like here in real estate. Client can walk in at any point. Walk on in here, sit down and go through our stuff. If they want to look at our listings, they're a customer. Now, do they get the same benefits as a client? What do you think, Aiden? No, no. 
because the fact is they have rights to certain things and we'll talk about that but they're limited to what they are provided versus a client okay now the key thing about agency like we said here is these changing roles there's constantly changing roles okay we're going to talk about it also consumers must make informed decisions the key thing as a real estate agent is me and Stefan and Miss Linda and Aiden today had a had a very good meeting today. We we're talking about a client and all in regards to their property. But ultimately, Mr. Grossman, whose decision is it on their property on the price they want to accept? Is it yours? No. Is it mine as a broker? Mm -hmm. Is it Miss Linda's as an office manager? No. What about Aiden as an agent? It's nobody's but the sellers. It's nobody's but the sellers. It's none of ours. It is our seller's duty. So are you telling me, Mr. Grossman, that if I'm representing Miss Davenport and she tells me her house is really, I look it up and I see it's only worth 200 and she tells me she wants to sell it for a million and I tell her, Miss Davenport, you're crazy. It's not going to sell for a million. Okay. And she says, I want to list it for a million. Are you telling me that I got to go and list her house for a million dollars? Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. I have to. Because whose duty is it? My duty is to look out for whose interest if she's a client. I gotta look out for Miss Davenport. Even if she says, shoots her boy a crazy number, I still have to put it out there. That's right. Period. No ifs, ands, buts about it. Okay? Now, most real estate agents would do what? Well, I'm not dealing with Miss Davenport. I'm just gonna go somewhere else. Well, what's, what's actually the opportunity here? You think about it. Marketing. Exactly. Her house may not sell, but what do I get to put up, Mr. Travis? I get to put what in her, her front yard? A sign. a sign. So if I put a sign in her front yard and I say for sale, guess what? People are going to start doing what? Calling. They may not end up wanting her house. I got another one. Okay. Now, let me ask, let's play with that real quick, Mr. Travis. So. I call you, you're you're putting a sign in Miss Davenport's for a million. And I call you and I say, hey Travis, how much are you wanting for that? Can you just immediately say, no, you don't want to deal with that? Let's no. go What do you have to do? I have to tell them all the information that I'll be given. You have to tell them all. And then if that client says, oh no, that's way too high for me, mm -hmm. then what can you say? <laughs> well, if you're not interested in that property, I've got to other ones I can all right. that one. And it helps you get a what? It helps you get a lead. Yeah. Okay. So while a client may shoot a crazy number, the best thing that you want is don't simply just turn them down. Because I guarantee you this is what, this is what happens. Once I put a sign in this Davenport in your yard, and 365 days go and not one person shows to look at your house, are you going to start to reconsider your asking price? Yeah. She's going to sit there and say, man, maybe I am too high. And then she ends up, she says, well, I'm going to drop it to 800. Drop to 800, the other 365 goes by, and then what she's going to say? Yeah, I really need to drop this price. Okay? I've been there, done that before. People tell me all the time, you're crazy for putting a sign up for a crazy amount. No, I'm not. I'm getting free advertising with that sign up from my front yard. Okay? I'm not having to pay for that. So, again, though, your customers have to make informed decisions. Now, Mr. Aiden, are customers always going to end up making the right decision. No. No. Even if you give them clear as day data, are they going to listen to you? No. no. I can go to Miss Linda right now and I can say, Miss Linda, here's what your property's worth. $200,000. Here's all the data, Miss Linda, right here. Here it is, $200,000. And what can she end up doing, Mr. Eugene? I still want $8,000. Yeah, I still want $800,000. 800. Yeah, I still want $800,000. Right? Eight million. Yeah. Well, this lady's not in charge anymore. Yeah. <laughs> so in that situation they is, they don't always make the best decision, but what do they end up doing? They're going to make a decision and you just accept it. See, sometimes client or agents, they're like, well, I'm not going to waste my time on it. No, you put it out there and you help them and you do what they say. Because the best thing you can end up doing is you're putting it out there for them. You don't know why they're asking it. You don't understand it, but you help them 
come to informed decisions, even if sometimes they got to find it out the hard way. Okay. I had a house that I listed crazy amount, knew it wasn't going to sell. I still kept in contact with the client and eventually the client had to bring down the price and I had to sell. That's how it works. Okay. But again, these are some information you need to be aware of. Now, like we said earlier on that previous slide, brokers work for clients, but with their customers. We're going to go to that in a minute. So what is agency? Well, it's the person acts on behalf of another. Okay. Now this is the key thing. How many of you ever heard of this word called an attorney? What's an attorney? Mr. Aiden, what's an attorney? A lawyer. A lawyer. What's a lawyer? What's so important about a lawyer? They're really smart. They know the law. Are you sure? No. Hey, there's plenty of realtors out there that, oh, yeah. that people say. No. no not always. But there's somebody that is educated in law. Yes. Correct? So in that particular situation is that lawyer, what's the lawyer's job? What does a lawyer do? Do they sell real estate? Do they uh, sell hamburger meat at Walmart? No. Uh, what do they do? Legal. Legal. But what? But what do they do? Who, who hires them? Represent the client. Exactly. They represent a client. Guess what? Their their part of representing is the same level as you as a real estate agent. So, Mr. Aiden, when you get a client, your duty is the same as a as a lawyer. The only difference is how many years of school did you have to go through? Uh, about six months. Yeah, for real estate, it's yours six months. Yeah. How long has a lawyer got to go to school? <laughs> Three to four years, plus your bachelor's and everything else. So about eight years. Yeah. But do you see yourself at the same level? Oh, yeah. Okay. That's why I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> so in that situation is, you've got to end up, y'all yeah. both are at the same level. So what do you think if you get if you get sued? Do you think a judge is going to say, well, you know, Aiden, you went to six months of school. We're going to make it a little easy on you, but lawyer, we're going to get on you. No. Is that how that works? No. No, what's going to happen? Same, same, same amount. amount. You know, both are the same amount. You're both going to be treated the same. Okay? So, when you're working on behalf of someone else, do you think a lawyer can say, well, hey, uh, Mr. Travis, you know, I'm, I'm Aiden's lawyer here. Uh, so if, if we go over here, Mr. Travis, and, uh, you know, you go and put Aiden in jail, I'm going to make a lot of money. Can we work this out? Can, can I do that if I'm your attorney? No. Why? why? Why don't you want that to happen? Because your duty is to... Yeah. I'm going to throw you in jail so I can make some money. Well, I guess if you want to, yeah. But if, but am I doing my duty? No. No, not at all. That's when the broker comes to get him out. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. No, you can't. You, an attorney isn't going to do that. An attorney can't say, hey, Mr. Davenport, I know you're the prosecutor in this. Throw him in jail because if you throw him in jail, I can get a lot more money by doing more work for a state. So throw him in jail so I can go get it. Who's interested by working out here? Yours or mine? I'm looking at mine. That's why I like being an agent of you because that can just be like, it's not me that goes to jail. Send Justin. Yeah. <laughs> I suck on his behalf. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but in this situation is, is that you cannot put your interest first. It's just like in a house. What if Sheldon here, she goes over here and uh, I'm like, you know what, man, if I go over here and, and I go and, and I can get her to buy these two houses, then I'm gonna go get her to buy more and more and it's gonna be a ton of money in my pocket. Can I, can I do that, Ms. Sheldon? Is that okay with you if I, if I look out for my pocketbook and not yours? I mean, would you reuse me as your agent if I did that? No. Why not? I feel like you would be a little pushy. Yeah. <laughs> Take advantage. Yeah, and you probably want to come, you know, break my legs or something, right? <laughs> so in that situation is you don't do that. Your duty is not to your pocketbook. That's what I tell people all the time. There's a lot of times in real estate I see agents that are out there and they're looking out for their pocketbook. Not accepting. Not accepting. Your duty is to your client and for them to get the highest return. If you want to make money, then you stop representing clients and go do your own thing. Okay. But you do not represent clients and also try to make money at the same time off of it. That is highly unethical. Okay. And can get you in trouble. Okay. 
So what we call this is a fiduciary relationship. That's the legal term. It is a fiduciary relationship to that client. What I have represented Ms. Sheldon, I've represented Mr. Jacob and some other people that are here. My interest is not to Justin's pocketbook. My interest is to my client. What's going to give me the biggest return for my client? Not for Justin. I've had plenty of them. I've had houses that I wanted to buy, but I found a better deal and I gave it off to my clients. Okay? It is not to me. Y'all can ask any of my agents and even my office manager. There's been times that I've had to end up, I've had to work miracles, and those that had to be worked also caused me to lose money in commission. Okay? So in these situations is, is I don't look out for myself. Now, am I saying Aiden and Travis and Stefan that you want to work for free for the rest of your life? No. You have to. Exactly, right? you got to work for money. But I'm going to tell you there are times at some points that you may have to give some cash back. And that is you may be in a transaction that may doubt die because they want the wall money removed. And you may have to get rid of that wall money for a thousand bucks out of your commission. You got to do it to make the deal last. Okay. So again, you have to look out for who? For your client's interest, not your pocketbook. And unfortunately, too many realtors out here, they look out for their pocketbook than their own clients. And it's real sad. Now, there are laws that govern agency practices, and we're going to talk about those throughout this entire course. The ones that we're going to be talking about is going to be common laws and statutory laws. Now, common laws are basically, if you want to put next to it, you can put equal sign, judge-made laws. Okay? Judge-made laws. So what happens in that particular situation is, is these are actually court cases that have gone to court and a judge has made a ruling on it, okay? The statutory laws are written by legislators. So your legislation, your Congress, has gone, it came together, created certain laws, and they've created statutes, okay? These are what we're going to be looking at. And as a real estate agent, most of these will tell you that your duty as an agent is to who? Your client. And you never, ever, ever put your duties among, above your client, period. So I'll give you a quick little hypothetical. Miss Linda, question for you here. So Mr. Eugene's a real estate agent, and he's representing Miss Leela. I'm sorry, Miss Leela, by the way. But Miss Leela is being represented by Mr. Eugene here. Okay? And so, Miss Linda, I need your, you're a judge here, let's right. say, okay? So, Mr. Eugene's represent Miss Leela, and Mr. Eugene has uh, a family with five kids, and he lost his job, he's a new real estate agent, and he doesn't have any money, okay? But Miss Leela happens to end up, she found a property that she likes, and Mr. Eugene needs to pay his mortgage or otherwise his kids are going to be out on the street and his family's going to be on the street. And Miss Leela gives Mr. Eugene $2,500 for earnest money on a Friday after 5 o'clock. And Mr. Eugene says, well, I'm going to take this $2,500, go pay my mortgage, and then by Monday, I'll end up, I'll have some money and then I'll go receive that at the title company but I can at least keep my home for the weekend and then I'll be good. Okay. Is it okay for Mr. Eugene to take Miss Leela's money to go and pay his debt? Because so his poor little children, no. but, but he has poor little children at, at his house and, and they're going to start death. They're going to be out in the streets. And you know, is it okay if Mr. Eugene does that for takes that and then pay, but he'll pay it back Monday. Miss Nobles. Is, is that okay? No. Why is it not okay? His, his little kids are going to be... The N or the L, I said no. Now, Miss Leela, is, is it okay, Miss Leela, if he takes your money, and, and, but he'll pay it back? Well, we don't have to go. Well, I think the real question is, who going to know? Who going to know? That's her question. Who's going to know? Yeah. The question, the answer will be is, you're not supposed to be taking that money and giving it to your client. I still haven't heard the answer from anybody yet. <laughs> Can a real estate agent take money? No. No. I no. answered it in. Oh, no. No. A real estate agent 
cannot take money, the only person that can end up taking it is who? The broker. Okay, so let's change it up. Now, Miss Leela, I'm going to play with what you just said. There. Oh, whoa. Miss no. Miss <laughs> Leela goes over and she gives the money to me as the broker. And now I have to go over and I owe Miss Davenport some money. No. So I'm going to take Miss Leela's money, give it to Miss Davenport, and I'll pay Miss Leela's on Monday. You can't do that either. Why can't I do that? No. What's it called? Because what's the word? I can't. Yeah. <laughs> it is that, but what's what's it called? Uh, Travis, do you remember what it's called? No. A, do you remember? Start with C. Uh, Conflict of interest. Nope. <laughs> Commingling. Commingling. A broker can never, ever, ever commingle funds on their benefit. You cannot commingle. If a client gives me money, that money has to go in a separate account yeah. and has to be held in trust in that separate account. And there's a certain amount of time that you've got to get it over there too, correct? There is a time frame on certain things, yes ma'am. But in the key thing is, is Justin or any broker can take a person's money, pay my personal bills with it. Okay, I cannot pay my personal bills with my client's money, ever. And an agent can never take money, ever. So they're gonna, I'm gonna tell you on the test, guess what they're gonna do? They're gonna give you a sob story. This poor little lady's about to go homeless if she doesn't get it, so she took this money and paid for it, and blah, 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 and, it, and that should be an exception to the rule. Nope, zero, you cannot take people's money, okay? Now, what about the Texas Real Estate License Act, the track rules, and you? Well, we all talked about trailing. It was Texas passed the first law governing the activities of real estate professionals in 1939. You have to know that year. You have to know that year. Legislature created TREC in 1949. It took them four or 10 years to actually create the agency that was going to enforce the laws. So we had the laws, but we had to wait 10 years to actually get the agency to, to actually enforce it. And this was way before my time. Okay. And I think my mom was 1949, at least 100. Around and I there. think you need to put that on and kick that <laughs> <on. laughs> So around there, there was the legal. You looking good. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> <laughs> so, in this time, there was the legal framework for licensees. It created how you become a licensee, okay? And also, it defined what agency was. What exactly is the same agencies, okay? Now, TREC, this is some more things you got to know. TREC has nine appointed members, not elected. They are appointed, so there are nine of them. Their function is to enforce TRALA and to protect the public. So, Ms. Uh, Sheldon, if we're protecting the public, does this mean that the real estate exam is going to be in the favor of real estate agents? That the exam is going to be about how to take advantage of your clients? No. <laughs> no, who's it going to be looking out for if you're thinking about this from the test purpose? The public. Yeah, so you want to make certain that your clients are looked out for. Okay? So in these particular situations is, we're going to look at this. It's enforced by trailer, but they protect the public. So when you're taking your test, guess what? You just need to look at the test from the perspective of it's looking out for the benefit of the public, not you as a real estate agent. Okay? Now, they do oversee licensing. They also monitor educational activities. So their key function is they basically make sure that the real estate industry is playing fairly, okay? They also have been empowered by the Texas Administrator Code in regards to certain types of things that they can and cannot do, okay? Together, Trek rules and trailer basically governed your conduct 
and also how to protect the general public. They're not here to look out for you as an agent. Now, I'm not saying Trek doesn't care about you. I'm saying Trek has a duty by law to make certain that you and I and everyone else is not benefiting at the, basically, the harm of another. Okay. Why is that? Well, Mr. Aiden, you said earlier, when you took your courses, do you have more knowledge than a normal person uh, in regards in to regards real estate? To, oh, yes. Yeah. Because you did what? Did the class. You took classes, you took the exam, so you are more educated than a normal person. And because of that, you could use that to your advantage, right? Yep. So could you take it, if you wanted to, could you take advantage of Ms. Stabenport right now? Yes. Yeah, why? Because you know the ins and outs. Yeah. She has no idea. So in that situation is, it would be unfair to her if you benefited off of her behalf. Okay? So the duty is, is Trek sets a laying foundation of what exactly is going to be classified as, we got to bring the foundation where it's equal, where it's not fair for you to go over and take advantage of other people. Okay? Now, the roles that people play in real estate agency, okay? There's a lot of them here. All right. So the licensed parties, like we just talked about, Mr. Aiden, is what? Look how many people here are licensed. There's a lot of them. How many of these down here in consumers are licensed? None. Zippo, Nada, okay? So in the licensed parties, the salesperson or the broker, of course, has to be licensed. Any associate, salesperson, or broker also has to be licensed. The agent or sub-agents, the landlord or the seller's agent, buyer's agent, or intermediary, all of these people have to hold a real estate license. Now, Ms. Linda, I want to test you for a minute. Can Aiden be all of these people? I would say yes. You're correct. Aiden can be all these people, except he can't be a salesperson or broker at the same time. Well, right. you got the or. Okay? Right. Yeah. But yes, Aiden could be a salesperson. Aiden could be an associate salesperson. Aiden could be an agent or a sub agent. So Aiden could be the seller or landlord's agent. He could be the buyer or tenant representative. Or he could work one side of the intermediary. Okay? So, yes, as long as you have a real estate license, guess what, Aiden? You can do all of these. Okay? So, in that situation, yes, one person, a lot of people always ask me this question all the time. Well, professionals got a question and say, what's that? They said, well, do I need a license for each one of these? Do I need a license to be an associate salesperson? Do I need a license to be a landlord agent? Do I need a license to be a buyer? Nope. Your real estate license covers it all. My other favorite question is this. Well, can I, can I, or do I have to have a separate license to sell commercial real estate? Nope. Your license covers you for everything. Okay. Now, a consumer, this is a lay person, it's a public individual, will either be classified a client or a customer. Now, to determine what that is, is one question. Is, is a contract been signed? Has a contract actually been signed? Because the fact of the matter is, is if the contract has ended up being signed, what ends up happening? What happens if a contract signed? What are they? They're client. If a client has been, or a client contract has been signed, they are a client, okay? If there is no contract signed, they're a customer, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Actually, we'll talk about it now. <laughs> okay? Here's your deal. A client is just like an attorney. Mr. Travis, if you walk into an attorney's office today, and you don't sign anything, you just walk right on in there, and you say, all right, what advice you give me uh, about suing Miss Linda to get all my money back? Here we go. Okay? <laughs> How much, how much advice are you going to get? None. None, because why? 
Yeah. You didn't sign that. Yeah. They're going to look at you like, well, it depends on uh, who the heck are you, yeah. right? Okay. I'm the person that's living at least. You don't get to talk about That's right. Apparently. So, <laughs> so in that situation is, guess what? <sighs> He's not entitled to advice. If he is a customer, he can get basic information. He can get assistance, and he'll get fair treatment. But he is not getting any advice, opinions, or high level of service. It's just like when a client calls our office and says, Hello, uh, Mr. Eugene, this is uh, Sam, and uh, I saw your property on 123 Main Street. And I was wondering, Mr. Eugene, uh, could you uh, give me some advice on if that price is a good price? Can you do that? You sign a paper, so I can't do that. He didn't sign any paperwork, and since he didn't sign any paperwork, what ended up happening? He's just a customer. So unfortunately, I'm sorry, I can't give you that advice because you're a customer and you're not a client. This was not. What if somebody calls and say, hey, I saw on, say, Zillow, $200,000 on 319, I mean, uh, 123 Main or whatever you said. Yeah. Can you say, yes, that is the correct price, or how do you answer that? Yeah, you can answer, you can give them basic information that's online. Okay. You can confirm that information. So, Ms. Davenport calls you and asks you, is 123 Main Street sold for 200000 You look on the MLS, yes, ma'am, it is. Anything that's public, you can verify to her. But when she starts saying, well, what's your advice on that? Do you think it's overpriced? can't say that. I have to I'm sorry. I, I, we don't have a contract, so I can only give you this information. I can't give you this information. Right. It's not that you're discriminating. So the fact of the matter is what? She's not signed a contract to be legally represented by a realtor at that point. Right. Okay. So when, for example, Mr. Grossman goes out, somebody calls him off of our lead generation and he goes out and shows a property. When he first goes out, Mr. Grossman, how often does a client actually sign a representation form with you? Not when you first go out. Not at first when you first go out. So in that situation is, when you go out there then, Mr. Grossman, which one of these is your is this person? They a client or they're a customer? Oh, well, they're a customer. They're a customer. So Mr. Aiden, you're this person that just called you. You went out there and showed him, and while you're walking around, he goes, man, what do you, what do you think about this area? Think it's a good area? Do you think I should offer him two thousand dollars? I don't represent you, so I can't say anything. That's right. You simply say, "Well, you know, Mr. Aiden, uh, those are some good questions for me in order to advise you on this. I have to have some documentation because if somebody comes back at me, I have to pay for it. Okay? I can show you the property all you want, but I can't give you advice, opinions, or your my highest level of service." If you would like those, if you wouldn't mind signing this document, I can then do that. Okay? So, Mr. Ain, all I can give you is this here. Information assistance and fair treatment. Okay? So, if you want the top level of service, you want to sign my, my contract. Okay? So, these are your differences. Okay? These are very key. Now, I'll throw one more thing in here. Okay? I'd love to do this. All right. So, Ms. Davenport, you have a house that you are selling, okay? You're selling this property. You're selling Travis's property because he's so broke from all the money Miss Linda owes him. So, you, so you're selling it. Yeah, you, you have to sell it off. So, she's selling your property, Travis, for you. And, uh, Mr. Eugene, you've gone out, and uh, you take uh, Mr. Aiden over there to look at it. And Mr. Aiden, when you first told Mr. Aiden, Mr. Aiden, I need a contract signed so I can advise, he said, I don't need any sign of that crap. I just want to look at it. Just want to look at it. So Mr. Eugene, you go out there, you show him Ms., uh, Mr. Travis's property. And Ms. Davenport tells you, says, you know, uh, let us know what you think. So while you're walking around the property, Mr. Aiden's like, yeah, I know they're wanting 300000 I, I could pay 300 but I want to put an offer in at 250 okay? So you said, okay, well, you want to put an offer? Well, would you like to sign a contract so that I can represent you? I ain't signing any of that crap. I just want you to submit an offer on my behalf. Okay? 
Can he do that real quick, Stephen? Can he, can, even if he does not have buyer rep, can Mr. Eugene still write a contract on behalf, on behalf of Aiden? Yes, he can. Yes. Yes, he can. Mr. Aiden, are you entitled, if he's writing a contract, to any of this up here? Am I entitled? Yeah. You refuse to sign a buyer's rep, but you want him to write a contract. Oh, am I entitled to it? Yeah. No, you're still not. You're still a customer. So, Mr. Eugene, you write a contract, 250. Mr. Aiden said he could pay 300. You call Ms. Davenport up. He say, hey, Ms. Davenport, uh, this is Eugene. I've got a contract for you, um, and I want to send it over to you. Is that all you is that all you are required to tell Ms. Davenport? What, what else is there? No, what did he tell you? <coughs> what did he tell you? Well, he's got 250. What, what did he say? He could pay three. Is, is that valuable information to you, Mr. Davenport? That he could pay $300,000? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. So in that situation, that's valuable information to Ms. Davenport. Okay? Extremely valuable. Are you required in that situation for Mr. Aiden? Can you share that with her? You have to. Because you know what? He refused to do what? He refused to sign the paperwork with Ms. Davenport, or with you, I mean. So therefore, you are acting as a sub-agent of Ms. Davenport, not an agent of Mr. Aiden. So whatever Mr. Aiden told you, you have to tell Miss Davenport no ifs, ands, buts about it, period. So do you see why it's imperative that your your client, the person, you as an agent, need to explain this? Because Mr. Aiden, I want to ask you this question. How would you feel? Think about this. How would you feel that after Miss Davenport gets the offer, she marks through it, puts three hundred thousand, sends it back? And then you tell Mr. Eugene, what the hell is that? Blah, 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 blah. What that? Why? And he says, well, I had to tell her. How are you going to feel about that? Pretty ticked. You'll be mad, aren't you? Yeah. Now, if Mr. Eugene had explained to you why you need to sign a contract, would you have been more willing to sign that contract? Most likely, yeah. Yeah, because why? Because I get to pay less. You get to pay less, and that information stays where? Confidential. Confidential. See, a lot of people don't understand that. If Miss Davenport ends up, if she does, or if Mr. Eugene, you have a customer, you are a sub-agent to her. Now here's the question. What if Mr. Eugene, Miss Davenport is my agent and you work for Miss Leela? So two different brokerages. Do you still have to share that information with Miss Davenport? Yeah. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Even if you don't work for the same brokerage, you're still a sub-agent of that person. That's right. So he's a customer. Okay. Very key there. I have still had clients that have refused, even after I explained all that to them, I still refused to sign. And at that point, I'm a sub agent and my duty is to whoever that list agent is. Okay? Sometimes we have agents that say, do they really have to? And then you have to explain that to them. The why yeah you have to explain that. to them the importance of it because of the fact of the matter is miss davenport's duty if she's representing travis travis my question for you you hired miss davenport are you hiring her to get you the cheapest price for your house yeah or no for, my house. for your house you're selling your house yeah, no. no why don't you want her to get the cheapest price because I, I want my money you want your money you got to pay miss linda's debt back right yeah so in this situation is I know you got to figure some way out here. So in this situation, is Miss Davenport has a duty to Travis, has a duty to him. So because of that, Miss Davenport, you have that duty, Mr. Eugene. If you don't share that information, you might have put Miss Davenport in legal hot water. I'll pass my debt on to Darren. Yeah. Okay. So again, why do we study agency? Well, we are going to have, number one, litigation has shot through the roof. And especially litigation does what right now during an economic downturn? 
what does it do? No, even I. Okay. So litigation has increased. So why do we need to study it? Well, you need to be aware of these things. There are agents out here today, guys and gals, that don't even know what I told you. Have no idea. I want to. I want to just pull my people real quick because it's been a while. Mr. Aiden, did you even know that? Honestly. No, which part? What I just talked about. Mr. Knowles has to share that with Miss Devin. Oh, or yes. Not. Yes, I did? do remember that. Yeah. Miss Travis. Miss Devin. That's what I love. My agents know their stuff. That's good. But there are agents, guys and gals, I guarantee you, you go pull agents around town, you'd be shocked at those numbers. Shocked. I had one agent that's been in the business for over 10 years. I was telling him about that. And they're like, no, oh, that's not what it says. I had to go send them the paperwork to show them. Trick rules, state, block. And I put it out there. But see, the thing is, is there's increased litigation. Another thing is, who does the licensee represent? We're going to talk about this as we go through this course and the next course. Here's the thing. There are agents out there that are representing people when they don't even have a listing contract. There are real estate agents that are out there. Mr. Stephan one day goes and talks to Miss, uh, Mr. Jacob one day. He talks to Mr. Jacob. He says, hey, Mr. Jacob, you know, you should sell your house one day. Mr. Jacob says, yeah, I was thinking about that. And then Stephan says, well, I'm going to go put a sign up if you don't mind. Okay, that's fine. He puts a sign up. I can't do that. Why can't he do that, Miss Linda? There's no contract. There's, There's no contract. contract. There's no representation. He's just having a casual conversation. But let me tell you something. Mr. Jacob probably didn't even know he did anything wrong. No. He may have just been nice saying, hey, put your sign up. He's trying to help step it out. That's right. So a lot of times, people don't even know who they represent. Another thing is, real estate agents like to do open houses. Why do they do open houses, Mr. Eugene? What do you think the purpose of them doing open houses? Sell the house or what? Well, they want the people to see the inside of the house. But market. what's the main purpose? To, to get more clients. Get more leads. It's not so much to sell the house, it's to get more leads. The more leads I do, the more money I make, right? Okay. Yeah, of course, if I sell the house, great, but I'd rather the house sit so I can keep showing open houses and get more people. Okay, so in that situation is what? Who does the licensee represent? The licensee represents the person that's the disclosure. Okay, you have a duty. Let me ask this real quick, Miss Linda. Does the open house, is it always the listing agent that's at the open house? Who, who could be showing? If I have a listing, who could show my listing? Yeah. Who could do an open house? Any agent. Could Miss Davenport from, from Century 21? If she's an agent with Century 21, yes. But I'm with my own company. Can she still show mine? Yes. What about Travis, who's with the person down in Dallas or up in Dallas? Can, can, can he come show mine? Yes. What about Aiden, who's out in Amarillo? Can he show them? Yes, as long as they're a licensed agent. As long as they're a licensed agent, they can. But if Miss Davenport, if you walk into an open house, it's listed by me, just has my name, no picture. And Aiden sitting there, what would you assume Aiden is? If you just were walking in, didn't know no better, you're gonna think he's who? Okay. Me. Because I'm yeah, because I'm the what? My name's on the on the sign. So you're gonna assume Aiden is who? Justin Owens. Well, there's that sign. But Aiden, are you really the broker? Nope. No. So you have a duty to explain who you are and who you represent. You have that duty. Now, can I ask you a question? Yes, ma'am. You said it could be in, they could be from Dallas or whatever. Uh -huh. Do they have to be under, the, you're under MLS. Do they have to be under the MLS? Nope. nope. I can let anybody hold, 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 post an open house if I want to. As long as they are. As long as I'm in agreement with them and they're in agreement, then yes, they can come down and post open house. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just a curiosity though. Now, here's the reason that there's a problem. Okay. Is sometimes there can be unintended agencies or accidental agencies. Let's say that I am the list agent and I'm selling uh, Mr. Colton's house and I hold an open house and Mr. Keith comes in to the house and I'm sitting there and I'm representing Colton, you know, as the seller and Mr. Keith comes in, he walks around the house, Mr. Keith assumes what? I'm that person. Or he may do this. He's taking Justin's real estate courses 
and he learned about that there might be other people showing. Maybe the list agent isn't it. Maybe Justin is just an agent sitting here. So, Mr. Keith, I go around and I'm showing Mr. Keith the house and all, and I don't tell him who I am. And Mr. Keith's like, yeah, I'd like to put an offer in on this house. And I say, okay, I can draft one up for you. And I start drafting the contract up and everything, and I put all the stuff in here. Could Mr. Keith unintendedly or accidentally think that I represent him? Yes. Yeah. See a problem? And by the way, my duty is to who? <laughs> to aid in this situation. Is my duty to Mr. Keith? No. no. So Mr. Keith tells me he can spend two hundred fifty thousand on this two hundred fifty thousand dollar house, but he wants to put in one eighty. What do I do? Hey, he can do two fifty. Yes. See a problem? Because there can be these accidental agency relationships, and then guess what? Mr. Keith finds out about it after the fact, and Mr. Keith says, "Screw you, Justin." You cost me money, and I thought you represented me, so I'm suing you. See why it's important that you say who you represent? No ifs, ands, buts about it. Your duty is to your client. Now that leads me to the next question. Can a spy do that as well? Huh? Do they have spies that come around? And oh, do that? of course. There's always spies with Trek. Trek always has people watching. They always have people watching. Okay? <laughs> But let me say this, Mr. Aiden, you go over, sir, and you end up, you're, you're hosting a house for, who do I got in here? You got Miss Leela. You're hosting a house for Miss Leela. Okay. All right. You go in, you're representing her. Okay. In this particular situation, we have, for example, we have Mr. Garrett, okay? Mr. Garrett comes in, and he says, how are you doing, Aiden? And Aiden, he says, I'm good, I'm good. And he says, well, I want to look at this property. Okay, come on in, Garrett. And he starts looking around and everything. He says, man, I, I like this house, Mr. Aiden. It's, it's a nice house. I, I know that you represent Miss Leela, but I want you to represent me, too. Can you represent Miss Leela and Mr. Garrett? Why do you say no? Because I can't act in both of their best interests. You I cannot can choose one or the other. That's correct. So if that happens, Mr. Travis, what does he have to do? You can you can technically be an intermediary between the two, but then you can't give either one of them information. You can't be they can't be your clients. So there's, there's more to that. So an agent can't ever represent both, but a broker can. Yes. Okay. So as a broker, I could hold both. But like though it was Travis was saying, I cannot give either information as a broker. But a real estate agent never can be an intermediate. Mm -hmm. Okay. An agent can only represent one side. So this is the problem. Here's the problem. Let's 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 put it even more here. You ready, Mr. Aiden? Mm -hmm. So you procured Miss Leela's listing. You've got it. you hosted an open house, and Mr. Garrett comes in, and Mr. Garrett wants you to represent him. You go to your broker, Mr. Justin, and say, "Guess what, Justin? I got two people. I'm getting six percent commission. Yahoo!" Okay. Then your broker. Walks in and says, Mr. Uh, Aiden, unfortunately, you cannot represent both people by law. I have to take one of those. I have to take Garrett away from you. And I have to give him to Miss Davenport. How do you feel about that? You did all that work. And I just took away your chance to get 6% and I gave him to Miss Davenport. Are you happy about that? No. Pretty mad, aren't you? What about the relationship now between you and Miss Davenport? Y'all on good terms now? Oh, I'm heated. You're salty. heated. Uh huh. <laughs> You're salty, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. But did she do anything wrong? Nope. She did nothing wrong. You mad at me? Yeah. Be honest. <laughs> yeah. You're oh, furious yeah. at me. Oh, yeah. But guess what? It's the law. 
You can give I tell, your three percent. I tell people yeah. this all the time. It's not that, and I'll tell you guys and gals, I'm just gonna be honest with you. It happens a lot in real estate. Person goes out, they secure the listing, they go do the open house, they do all the work, and then they get a client comes in, and then the broker says, Well, I'm sorry, Miss Davenport, you did all the work and spent all this hour and money and time on but I gotta take that client that you just did and give it away to another person. And you're like, but Justin, I spent all this money and I know, but Trek doesn't let me do it. Trek does not allow a real estate agent to procure or to work for both sides. Enrique. I, yes, I have a question. What's up? If you were to give, you know, you gave it to somebody else could you work out with that real estate agent and be like, hey, I'll only give you like 1.5% or the... So good question. Depends on the brokerage that you're in, Enrique. Some people like me and my firm, we have, I ended up, I had a, just a meeting with all my agents and we sat down and talked about it. So what we do is in that situation is, is if Aiden procured it, Aiden would keep 4% and then 2% goes to the other agent. Now, I will say some of the larger brokerages do not allow that. Some of the larger brokerages only allow you to end up, basically you lose every bit. It goes three, three. But it really depends on who sponsors you is what the question is. So that's a good question when you're going to interview with brokers. How exactly do you do splits in situations like this? So normally in the bigger brokerages i'll tell you why they don't want to end up doing like say four or five percent to you and one to the other one is because of the fact is is that that agent would make more money than the brokerage would if you see what i'm saying they make more money if it's split three and three than if they do five percent and one percent and that five percent is at an 80 20 split and the one percent is at a 50 50 split you see what i'm saying there okay yeah. Does that does that does that answer your question? And if it doesn't, let me know. No, it, it does. It does. Okay. So it really it just varies on the individual brokerage, and then it also depends on what that person is. Now, I just found it easier in my office. I just find it easier to this way. We normally do a standard where it splits, where four goes to the one and two to the other. But say for example, Enrique that you were sponsored by me and you and Travis say, Enrique, you did all the work and you and Travis talk and you told Travis, Hey man, I want to end up giving you 1%. I'm going to keep five because I did all the work and I'm going to have to finish all the work. Are you cool with that? And if Travis says yes, then y'all would fill out a form in my office saying, this is what we're agreed to. And that's how I'm going to split. It. But it really depends on what brokerage you're with in order to how they're going to split your commission, if that makes sense. So it's a very fine line. And that's why I tell people a lot of times, big brokerages can be great. They can be wonderful. They have a lot of things they can provide, but where you pay for it is when it comes to the commission splits, if that makes sense. Because the commission splits is where a lot of times you can have this convoluted stuff and it can be a mess really, really, really quick. So. There's pros and cons with everything, just like independent firms, there's pros and cons. But good question there, Enrique. All right, another thing is, in order to fix this issue, okay, they do have the TREC, and we call this IABS. So if you wanna write that down, IABS, that's what we call it. Uh, it basically tells you who this party works for. So for example, if, uh, you know, say for example that Keith gets mad at my services or gets mad at Stefan, okay? He's representing me. It tells Keith who exactly Stefan's boss is, who's the boss of that boss, and who's the overall brokerage, okay? So it gives the client the information on how to complain if they have an issue, okay? And it is required, this form is required to be in almost every bit of your communication, every email, every website, everything, this must be disclosed. And it has to be clearly disclosed, okay? Again, the format, how you format it is voluntary, but the content, the wording has to be the same. You cannot change the wording. 
I had a, a agent before that she was very girly. She loved a bunch of girly flowers and hearts and roses and all that. And she did not like my typical white sheet of paper with black words on it. She didn't like it. She didn't want basic stuff. So she went down to Office Depot and she had some flowery colored paper and she had it printed all on it and all made it look nice. And that's fine. The format can change, but the content still has to remain the same. Now the key thing, however, and this one right here is the older version of it, okay? But the key point of it is this, is that these words up here, all of these words, okay, have to be stated and they cannot be in smaller than 10 font or 10 point font, okay? Cannot be smaller than 10 point or 10 point font. Now, what, another reason we study agencies is what's the public perception? Unfortunately, it's really sad to be honest, but most real estate, if you ask the person whether it's a real estate agent or, you know, where do you rank a real estate agent? Most of the time you have used car salesman and then, and then a realtor. Okay, we're underneath the used car salesman most of the time. And the reason being is, is it sad to say, but a lot of people give real, real estate agents a bad name because they get money hungry. They get money hungry. If you're going to survive in this business, you cannot get greedy. Can't tell you how many times just as a real estate broker that I have to deal with that. They, the client gets really, 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 really greedy. Okay. The problem in that situation is, is if they get, if you're as an agent, you get greedy, you lose the focus of what we just started this chapter off with. And what did I end up telling y'all was the most important thing to Aiden? Uh, your representation. Your client. Client, yes. It's easy. It's easy to sit down, put a contract in, and see you're getting three percent of three or of a million dollars, and that's thirty thousand dollars. It's easy to want to try to find a way to get more money. It's easy to end up in the situation to lose focus. It's very easy. Guys and gals, I've been doing this for a long time. It's extremely, extremely easy to lose focus in this industry. And it's sad to say. But I want to tell you all in this situation is, you cannot put your, your personal interest above your clients. Period. Do you think me as a real estate broker? I, let, let me just let me give you a, let me give you a real life example. I'm not going to say names. I'm not going to go into all that. But I'm going to be I'm going to tell you a real life situation that occurred. It occurred, and I'm not going to tell you where or anything, but I'll tell you what happened. About I'd say ten years ago, when I first started in real estate, a uh, I had a team. And in my team, I ended up, I was recruiting. I was trying to get a bigger team. And what ended up happening in the situation was, as I got my team growing, one of my agents said, my wife wants to come from another firm to join your team. And I was like, why in the world would she want to come from a big firm to me? Like, that just makes no sense. I, I, at that time, I was a small little team with like five people. Okay. And I said, why in the world would they want to come to my firm? Well, just lo and behold, what happened was this individual, uh, their broker had a listing, a very high dollar listing, and she ended up, she found a buyer for that listing. And that high dollar listing was that broker's own personal listing. So the agent this person, this broker's agent, found the buyer, and the broker didn't want to pay out anything. Want to keep it all themselves. So how do you get rid of that problem, Mr. Uh, Travis? You don't want to pay a commission out, and you're say you're my agent, and I don't want to pay a commission out. What can I do? Bye bye. You're fired. Yeah. By the way, all of your people are my clients, so bye bye. Bye, Felicia. It, don't let the door hit you. And if somebody does that to you, Travis, 
How do you feel about that? Not good. Upset, right? You did all this work for nothing. So in this particular situation is, that happens. And I'm not just saying in this area, I'm saying across everywhere. The public perception is that real estate agents, we have a very bad public perception as being greedy. Okay. I'm taking a listing right now that's almost a million dollars, and I'm not taking a very large listing or a percentage out of it. You want to know why? Be honest with you. I know my clients very, very, very well. They have health issues. They have some issues with some monetary things. They have some very difficult things they're going through. More difficult than most people in their life go through. I sit down and I talked to this individual and she was telling me everything and we went through it and all and I told her, I said, you know what? I said, I would feel so wrong, feel so wrong to go over there and sell your property and take 3% of yourself. But I know you could take that money and you could end up, you could get your family member the medical help they need. Money will always come to you. Okay? Money will always come to you. Let me tell you this. You don't see that happening much. The saddest part was when I went out there and first interviewed with her, Miss Davenport, I tell you this, went up to their, their house. She had three different brokerages with interview with her. Every one of them, one of them said, is there any way you could work with me to give 1% back? I need to pay for my, my family member's medical stuff. And one of them said, I ain't got time for this BS. If you're going to freaking want my services, you're going to pay me 3%. You got that? That's not good. Okay. But now let me say this. I also have people that have tons of money that just like to be greedy. In that situation, you're going to have to hold your ground and say, I can budget. But when you know somebody that really has nothing in their bank account and their family member needs medical help and every penny counts, it's better to do something nice than to end up going over and being greedy. Okay. So again, you've got to have this emotional aspect. You have some type of emotion. Am I saying though, no, Travis, every single transaction, you should go just give money out to everybody. Just give money. No, no, no. I'm saying at some point you need to be able to have a heart. Okay. You need to have a heart sometimes. Some people tell me I have too big of a heart, but you got to have a heart. You got to care about people. Okay. Also, you awesome. You awesome. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> but you know, I look at it this way. I've always been taught I don't go out there and, and want it. You do things to help people out. That's what you do. You help people out because I believe it. I'm very strong in believing that life will pay you back. You'll get your stuff back, and sometimes tenfold. Okay, but you have to sometimes give a little. Okay, Emo or complexity, Mr. Grossman. This one's yours. Real estate, so simple, right? Every transaction, you send the transaction out, boom, immediately. They uh, sign a contract, it closes. It's simple, right? Just start to finish, easy. Close in five minutes. Huh? Yeah, the money just pours oh, well, money, money just yeah. pours in, Mr. Grossman? What do you mean, Mr. Grossman? Don't believe it. Mr. Grossman, yeah. for everybody listening online, Mr. Grossman, you have a client right now, am I correct? Mm -hmm. And uh, can I ask how many offers you've submitted and had it under contract and they fell through? How many have you had uh, with this same client? Uh, four. Four? But you, you threw that client to the side, right? You don't give a crap about them anymore. Is that how this works? No, it's still, it's still working. And do you have another contract? I do. So you're working on the fifth one? Mm -hmm. See, that's the thing. Real estate agents are not easy. They're complex. Not agents, but transactions. They're, they're complex. Agents are complex, too. That is true. <laughs> it just can be complex, too. I and mean, I guess I could have walked away from it. Yeah. The key thing is, is that when things get hard in real estate, you don't quit. I guarantee you, I can talk to Mr. Stephan, he'd probably be honest. I could have said, Mr. Stephan, how many times do you want to throw, throw this whole transaction away? He'd probably tell you five times. Okay. Or 20. Or 20. <laughs> but the key thing is, guys and gals, is that's part of this business. Okay. It's part of this business. 
you are going to have complex issues. But you guess what? You're also going to have easy days. Okay? That's why you need to learn HSEC. Yeah. Also, consumers are now, they've got this thing that's in Miss Linda's hand and Mr. Aiden's hand right now. What are those things? Working? What are those things? Smartphones. They're called cell phones and they have access to what? Wi-Fi, internet. To the internet. So because they have access to the internet, our customers have more expectations. That's right. And agents. <laughs> yep. But we're looking for, again, for customers. Okay. Customers. The customers have more knowledge. Mr. Grossman can tell you. He doesn't even have to look for houses anymore for his clients. What do they do, Mr. Grossman? They send them. They send them to him. Yeah. Before he even gets a chance to get on the MLS to look, they've already looked through 10 houses and already viewed everything from the pictures and all, and they're just ready to go look. So they're not looking for you to look for the houses now. What do they want? They want you to represent them. They want you to do the paperwork. They just want you to go and represent them. They don't need you to go take pictures anymore. They don't need you to do the normal, come open the door. I've already viewed them. Guys and gals, we have more people now from California, Arkansas, and all over that they have access to their computers that they're buying houses without even putting their feet in the state of Texas. Yes. They look online, they see the video, and they call you and they say, hey, Miss Davenport, I looked at 123 Main Street and I love it and I want to put a contract in. Yeah. And Miss Davenport's like, but you, you haven't even seen it. It doesn't matter. I want it. So in that situation is, they're more higher expectations. You don't have to be so much of a salesperson as much. They want you to be knowledgeable of the material, the content, the contracts. Yes. And they want you to be on call all the time, especially yes. if they're a million dollar home they're looking at. I don't care if it's two or three o'clock in the morning. You better answer that phone or they blow yes. your phone up. These customers now, they are expecting you to be available 24-7. 24-7. If you think you're getting in this career and it's going to be an eight to five job, I'm sorry to bust that bubble, but it's not. You think you get weekends off? Forget it. Steph, is that true? You get weekends off all the time, right? I wish, man. You wish. We have Mr. Aiden, you, you get weekends off, right? This past weekend, you didn't have to work real estate at all, right? Uh, people seem to leave you alone. Definitely was. was. Unfortunately. Unfortunately, even Mr. Travis. Yeah. It's constant. Okay. He's been poor Mr. Travis. Poor Mr. Travis is having to pay all that debt back Miss Linda Miss Linda racked up for him. So. Well I keep trying to pass it off to Darren, but he's not saying nothing. Well we'll, we'll transfer it to Darren after Darren, class. Darren, wake up. So but the next one is they also realtors or people are starting to see that they can use more than one broker. They can use more than one broker. And it's not that they're intentionally doing it. Now y'all be honest in here real quick. How many of you ever had a friend that was at work or whatever that was looking through listings? They have a realtor at home and they're looking through listings and they're like, you know, I want to help my agent out. So Mr. Travis, I'm going to help you out. But I'm going to sit here at work. You showed me about 10 properties, but you're such a busy person. I'm just going to look at home and try to help help you out. So I look through the internet. Oh, I like that one. Well, let me. Hello, Miss Davenport. Can I can I ask you a question? Is this uh, one two three Main Street? Does it have a fourth bedroom in there? Oh, it does. Okay. Uh, and y'all wanting 180? Okay, perfect. Yeah, my name is Justin Nobles. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Click. Okay, I'm, we're gonna go do. Mr. Travis, can you get me a showing at 123 Main Street? I called Miss Davenport. She gave me all the info, but I want to go see it real quick. Can, can you do that for me, Mr. Travis? I, I was trying to help you out. Sure. What just happened? Did, did I really help Mr. Travis out, Miss Linda? Yeah. What did I just do, Mr. Travis? I just cut you out of what? I cut you out of the transaction. Why? What was the procuring cause? That website procured my interest, which led me to call Miss Davenport, 
which is the listing agent. And now, can Travis get paid a commission? Nope. I had that happen, guys and gals, not too long ago. A client of mine thought he was helping me out. He drove around, found this one property. He saw the builder. He talked to the builder. He called me after he talked to the builder and said, hey, I'm going to go see 123 Main Street. Okay, let's go see it. He did not tell me he talked to the builder until after I get to the property, he tells me, oh, yeah, I was just talked to the builder. I know everything about it. I just want to see the inside. I call the builder. Hey, uh, I'm representing this person. Oh, I'm sorry. You don't get no commission because they talked to me. So I was procuring calls. I'm not paying a commission. That's the day we worked 17 hours. Yeah, that's the day we worked 17 hours. I did all that work and got zero dollars. Okay. Your clients, when they call people, they call another agent, they are the procuring calls. That's where you had this use of more than one broker. People now, they don't know the difference. They think they're helping their people out. They think they're helping their friends out. I'll help Travis out. He's been real busy. Let me do the phone calls, and then Travis can go show it and do the paperwork. Nope. The minute you call that list agent, guess what happens? You release your rights. And let me tell you, Mr. Travis, since I did what I did, Miss Davenport, she's going to look out for my interest, right, Mr. Travis? Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure, right? <laughs> no, Ms. Da now, Ms. Travis, I mean, Miss Davenport, who's your relationship to? To me, as a, a buyer or the person you're listing their house for? The seller, not me. Mm -hmm. You're representing the seller. So she's not looking out for Justin's interest. She's looking out for the seller. And her, own and her own interest. So guess what happens? Justin is now getting screwed in the transaction. Had I just let my agents do it, I'd have been good. So you never, ever, ever have your client call or drive around or things of that nature. So in that situation is, you have to make certain that you educate your client. Okay, you advise your clients in these situations. Now, they also are expecting more licensed professionalism. Yes, Mr. Travis. I was also going to say, there's a lot of clients that people just don't know that we don't get paid except for commission. Yep. So there's a lot of times that I'll, I mean, I literally just happened, it happened to me about 30 minutes ago. I just got a text from somebody. I asked if I could send them over. If, hey, that thing I sent you over for that agreement, can you send that back uh, for the the lease property or the, the you know the purchase property you're going to get can you send that thing back to me I'm like oh yeah no actually we actually found this other guy who's going to do it for us so we're going to go and go with them but you know i appreciate all the showings and everything you did and they like because they think we get paid yep. for our hours so they're like you know, i appreciate all the help and everything i'm like cool i just wasted two weeks yep for you nothing know, yeah trying to help you out and i'm not going to get anything from that so exactly this was don't know i'd like to say that they don't people don't understand that agents use their own personal gas, they use their own time, and all of that, and sometimes we fail to tell them thank you, and I just want to tell the guys thank you. That's also why it's important to get that agreement signed. One, they can't go to somebody else. Yep. And two, even if they don't buy something, you then have a right to charge them for your marketing fees and your that's correct. Yeah, your, your gas and stuff like that. That you, If I do five houses and two in Austin and one in Houston for some guy and I'm driving all around. Yep. And then at the end he goes, actually, we're not going to move. Yep. And I can still charge him for the gas when you drive to Austin twice and drive to Houston or whatever. That's right. And let me tell you, and that's the key thing a lot of people don't understand, is they assume, they assume, like you said, Travis, that if you go show Miss Davenport 60 properties, she thinks that me as your broker, I'm writing you an hourly check. Oh, absolutely. And I'm just going to, at the end of the month, I'm going to cut you a check. Here you go, Travis, and everything's great. But in reality, Travis, you've done all this work and made zero dollars. Okay? I can tell you guys and gals, if you really a life example with me. I showed a very good friend of mine, keyword friend of mine, even a friend to my mom, showed her 60 properties. My agent, one of my agents, one of my good friends, showed her probably another 30. She's seen about 100 properties. And then she decided at the last moment, that I was out of town, my friend was out of town, there's nobody else to show her properties. So she went down to the local uh, builder, talked to the builder, signed a contract, and nobody got any money. Nobody, except for the builder. 
So in that situation is, is it's imperative that you tell your customer or your client, hey, I need to rep you, I need a form, I need documentation. Because if I don't have a representation, guess what? I'm not showing you houses. I'm not wasting my time. I will not personally will not show you a house unless I have a representation form, period. Because if I don't have a representation form, I'm not driving all over God's green earth. Sorry, I'm not going to do it. Okay? I would rather lose the client and make no money than spend a lot of money in gas and time and all that and still make no money. Okay? So very important in that situation. So state agency laws. There are certain agency disclosure laws that we have to go through. We'll discuss those as we move forward. It also is a required topic by TREC that you have to study, just for requirement. So in regards to the relationships between principal and agent, you want to put next to principal, that's going to be the party that the broker is representing. Okay? So principal is going to be either the seller, the buyer, the landlord, the tenant, these are going to be the ones that is going to be the principal. Those are the people that are the principal. The agent is the broker, not the real estate agent, not the salesperson. It is the broker. Okay. So again, this discussion is continuous throughout the entire course. A licensee's relationship with a licensee's principal is that of fiduciary, which we've talked about, that I have the highest and best. It's important to always know who your principal is, okay? Because you have a duty to that. I had an agent before that used to work for me. They would get this individual. They'd say, for example, they get Leela under contract as the seller. They would do a bunch of showings, try to procure buyers, and then try to negotiate to the seller why the seller needs to accept the buyer's contract. That's not how this works. Your duty is to the seller, okay? You cannot end up having both sides. And it happens a lot, unfortunately. It also, it, you need to know what is required of you at various stages of the transaction. What are the various stages of the transaction? So the key points that we covered for this evening is that agents, of course, are going to work on behalf of another. Now remember, agent is who? A broker. You as a sales agent work on behalf of me, so you're like an assistant to me. Okay. Trela basically establishes the licensee's duties. They, of course, are going to be administered by TREC. Remember, you as an agent and the broker work for clients but with customers. Again, you want to do your best to avoid unauthorized representation. That is one of the key ones that happens in real estate. Okay. You also want to avoid any agency misrepresentations or misunderstanding. That's why it's always key that you explain if you get a listing, you're representing a seller agent, your duties to the seller, period. I don't care if you possibly try to convolute, make up a way to get the whole 6%. I don't care about that. Because we're going to talk about something in this class called DTPA. You may end up, you may try to get that whole 6% by you convoluting stuff. And guess what ends up happening? Yeah, you may have made an extra 3000 in commission, but guess what happened? Because of what you did, you breached the law. They can now sue you for three times what you made. So that three thousand you made, yeah, you get to pay nine thousand back in damages. Was it worth it? No, no, it was not. Okay. For brokers, from a broker's perspective, and you need to know these things as well. There needs to be a company agency policy disclosure form. There needs to be a way in regards to how we have this disclosure. There needs to be some type of form. You also need to have a training program for sales associations. You need to tell your associates what they can and can't do. 
Yeah, I, I can tell you. I've been in this business long enough. I've been in it over a decade. I can tell you. I've heard them all. Now, okay, Mr. Jones. All right, I was thinking about it. And uh, so if I do it this way and I shift it this way and I move it this way and I talk to it this way, then I can get to 6% and we're not breaking track requirements. But what about this big thing that says, track says you can't do it? Well, but you know, we could do this and maybe do this and move it around here and slide here and go here and do this. And do... No, no. Just gonna tell you, no, okay? You put too much liability it's not, I, I can tell you this, I've seen other brokerages, I'm on the board, I know a lot of these different things, I'm just gonna be honest with y'all. Real estate agents that try to play crooked are the ones that oftentimes either lose their license, get suspended, or get sued. Okay, and understand, let me explain how this works and the reason y'all need to know this. Say that Enrique in this situation is trying to get the full 6%. And I sponsor all of y'all, okay? And he's trying to get the full 6% of commission here. Well, he ends up screwing something up, and guess what happens? Trek comes in and investigates. Now, do you think, Miss Linda, that they're just gonna walk up to Enrique and slap him on the hand? No, 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 no. No, what are they gonna end up doing? They're gonna check it all out. They're gonna come to who? To you. To me. The broker. Anybody Why are you letting time? your agent do this? Why did you approve this? And if I say I didn't know nothing about it, they're going to say, then why ain't you keeping tabs on your agents? What What's going on here? Why are you doing this? And Mr. Nobles, because of his actions, we're suspending your license. So Mr. Nobles, your license is suspended. So Mr. Enrique's little trying to get another thousand, two thousand dollars here, just now suspended the broker, which means everyone in the firm is affected. Not just Enrique, but everybody. I'm so Enrique. You're Sorry, y'all. <laughs> Sorry, y'all. <laughs> so, so, so in this situation is, is that y'all have to understand is that you have to look at it from a bigger picture. And that's why, unfortunately, I have to make hard decisions. And Miss Linda can tell you, I've had to make very difficult decisions sometimes to say, you know what, Enrique, you're a great guy. You've been a good friend. I enjoy having you, but you're just risking me too much. Yeah. It's too much of a risk and you gotta go. It's not that I don't like you. It's not that I, I don't want you on my team. It's the fact that I can't have my whole firm jeopardized because of one person. Harsh, he's not even licensed yet. I know, I'm Harsh. just, I'm strict today, right? Yeah. <laughs> but no, and Enrique wouldn't do that. But I'm just saying is, in real life, there are gonna be those situations. And there are those times that Miss Linda will bring it to my attention. And it's the people I don't wanna get rid of, but I have to. And 99% of the reasons that are always the issues is the money. They want that money. Okay, and it's hard to say, but that's part of the business. Broker responsible for the licensee's professional actions. What I just said, if an agent does not follow broker protocol, the agent should be terminated, period. I have a three strike rule in my company. It ends up, if I find out that you ended up, you breached something, tells in my office okay normally the first one i'm pretty nice on i'll let miss linda come in there and say now aiden why did you do that don't you do that again you need to follow it, is it that okay. she's, the she's the harsh one she's the harsh one the first one's the worst she's the first one's the worst she's the angry miss <laughs> <laughs> linda comes in with the fried pan that's that's situation is yes miss linda comes in and she ends up goes over and she would talk to him and then the second time it's basically me and miss linda together and the third time is basically bye bye okay because of the fact of the matter is i cannot allow for my firm to be jeopardized if i have you know miss shelton 
who is over here working her tail off and following every single rule by the book. And I have Aiden over here trying to take all the money, get greedy. It's not fair that Sheldon gets punished because of Aiden. It's just not work. It's not fair. Aiden may be mad at me. He may hate my guts, but I got to get rid of it. I have to look out for the bigger picture. And that's why I'm also held responsible. So as associates, you need to recognize the various agency relationships. This is part of you as a real estate agent. Y'all need to know your different agencies. You need to continually be updated on how their agency relationships and how they work. You also need to know and apply your broker services. And do not ever contradict what your office policy says. The problem in most times, and I can tell you all this from years of experience, is that you talk to most real estate agents and you say, all right, hey, what's your office policy say on an intermediary? And it's, I don't know. What's your policy, Aiden, uh, for when you have a client sign a contract? How many days do you got to get that contract to your broker? Well, I don't know. Yeah, these are not things that are legit. Okay, you have to know these things. So my first question for y'all this evening. Why don't consumers understand the difference between client and consumer? And I want to direct this question to Mr. Garrett. Mr. Garrett, why don't consumers understand the difference between what a client is and a customer? What do you think? Um, they probably see themselves as both at the same time. Okay. Ms. Linda, do you agree? In some aspects, but I sometimes think that uh, we as consumers, when we meet our clients for the first time, I think that we think that they know uh, all the nope. rules. And you're, off, you're off track here. Okay, now I've done them. Nope. Mr. <laughs> Keith, what do you think? Um, I would say uh, consumers don't understand the differences because um, they're consuming. Uh, that's uh, my big thing. Uh, they're not actually, I don't know how to word it. Uh, they're, I guess they're too busy being consumers so they wouldn't know the difference between a client and because let me ask you this, before Keith, you came into any of these classes, sir. Yes, sir. Did you know anything about anything about real estate, like representing? No, not no. at all. No, oh. and you probably were like everybody else, even myself before I was licensed. You just look online at houses, you look at houses and you're like, hey, I'm gonna go call these people. You don't know anything about basically being a client or a customer. True, yes, so sir. So the thing is, is you think like most clients, I tell people this all the time, most people are not trying to purposely cut you out. Like Travis said earlier, he said, my client or my customer just cut me out of the transaction. But Travis, let me ask you this. Do you think they purposely were sitting at home going, ha, 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 I'm a customer, so I'm going to screw Travis out of money. Do, do they think that? No. They think what? Well, he was a nice young man and he showed me around and all. And you know what? He's very busy and I hate to bother him anymore. So I'm going to go over here and do what? I'm going to help him out by using somebody else. He's still getting paid. So we're everybody that's yeah, good. And I get my salary. Yeah, you get your salary. Yeah. But in reality, what's happening? They don't know this. They have no idea. So by all means is we have to make certain that it's a key point for us, a key point for us as licensed agents to do what? To educate. I guarantee you, you want a lot of views? 
go put a YouTube video out there explaining the difference between a consumer and a client and why you can upset a realtor. The 10 quickest ways to upset a real estate agent. Here's one of them. Because I guarantee you, they don't know the difference in this unless they've been represented by a agent. They don't know it. Okay. Mr. Colton, when you last bought or sold a home, were you a customer, client, or don't know? That's our first question. For you, Mr. Colton, we'll say rent. If you last rented a home, were you a customer, client, or don't know? Mr. Aiden, is he not here? Shame, shame, Mr. Aiden. I gotta give him a hard time. Let's see here. Miss Shelton. Miss Shelton. Um <laughs> a client. You were a client because you were my client. You did sign a buyer rep. Now do you recall sign a buyer rep? Probably not. <laughs> no, probably not. <laughs> But see, that's the thing in the situation is, is that clients oftentimes don't think what? They don't see that stuff. They're relying on who? On the professional, okay? Now, the question out, Shelton, for you, if you are not sure of the relationship, why didn't you know? Well, the question comes back, did you read every single document I said, sent you to sign? Right, it would come back to my own ignorance in the no, not. matter. Not so much your ignorance, it's a 50-50. Your broker was trying to end up getting you into the right house and did not have time to educate you. And you as a client were also busy with time to find a house that you didn't have time to read all that. I, I had that happen when I sent my client a uh, contract last night, it was- Click, click, click. I, I sent it at about 9 p.m. Yep. They somehow looked at all like 15 documents, maybe 25, 30 pages of stuff I sent them, and they, they signed everything and sent it back within about 10 minutes. And I was like, ah, all right. <laughs> yeah. But they, they went from not being interested to being very interested, very excited at the same time. So yeah. I sent them all the stuff they needed, and they sent it back. And yeah. And, 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 and I'll tell y'all, guys and gals, in June and July and August, okay. You're so busy trying to find the right house, and there are so many people out there doing the same thing, you don't have time. For example, Mr. Grossman, you're showing one client a million properties. Do you have time to really sit down with him and read word for word or explain word for word the contract to him? No, you don't. You don't have time to do that, especially when there's bidding wars going on. And he apparently knows it because he sends them back real quick. Yeah. Of course, Travis, I mean, Stefan sends it within two seconds back, okay? So, and the key thing is, is that it's not the client's fault. It's also the real estate agent. The real estate agent should be the one that is explaining this, okay? All right, Mr., let's see here. Mr. Jacob, you there, sir? Yes. I got a question here. At this point, what are some of the functions you would expect from an agent representing a seller? What are some things you would expect? You've dealt with uh, with representation. What are things that you would expect an agent to do if they are selling your property? What are your expectations? I would expect uh, him to uh, list the property and market it. You want them to market it too, right? Yes. And you also end up in the same situation, want them to look out for your best interest, correct? Yeah, I want them to get the maximum. Exactly. And to communicate. And to communicate with you. Those are the key things that they want from their client, okay? Or from their agent, I mean, from their agent, okay? So Mr. Jacob wants me, if I'm representing him, to get him the best price, make sure I'm getting the right stuff and also communicate. Now, is it my duty to end up making final decisions? No. no, my duty is to give the information in my opinion, 
But ultimately, the client, the seller in this situation, makes that decision. And that, that's a good thing to add in here. A real estate agent can never accept a contract or an agreement on behalf of a seller. Ever. Okay. So, Mr. Travis, if Mr. Jacob told you, I'll accept that offer, but he's not signed it, are you technically binding Mr. Jacob to the contract if you just tell Aiden, the, the buyer or seller's agent, that he's accepting the offer? No. When is it technically binding? When it's in what? Parties have signed. When all parties have signed. When they all have signed. So by you sending a text saying he accepts does not mean that you're bound to it when it's signed. Okay. So Miss Linda. My next question, so Mr. Jacob was helpful and he gave us the seller's perspective. What do you expect from a buyer? If Ms. Davenport is an agent and she's representing you to find a house to purchase, what are your expectations of Ms. Davenport? What do you want her to do on your behalf? I would tell Ms. Davenport the amount first that I have been approved for a certain amount of money and what my, rank, my amount Okay, is. you know too much already. Okay. So, Mr. Eugene. <laughs> Mr. Eugene. <laughs> Mr. Eugene. <laughs> knows right off the bat. Mr. Eugene, as a real as a buyer, because you've not you've not worked in the field, as a buyer, what would you want, Miss Davenport? What do you expect of Miss Davenport? Well, first, I say did on no. Let's just say it this way. Location. Miss, oh, hold on, Mr. Travis. How often does a client go and call you and say, uh, "Hello, Mr. Travis. Uh, this is Stephen Grossman, and um, and I've been pre-approved for this amount of money, and I have the pre-approval letter, and I want to send it over to you. And these are my criteria. Is that how this works? No. No. How does it really work, Mr. Travis? They just say, well, usually it's like, yeah, I just saw a thing, and I just figured, you know, it's time to move or something. So. Go show yeah. me this house. Yeah, I want to look at this place. When you sign something. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, the thing yeah, is, is I, it shouldn't be really a problem or something. Like, I could probably, you know, like, get a. Oh, yeah, I can get $500,000. Yeah, whatever. Now, Mr. Eugene, <laughs> what do you expect from Ms. Davenport? Not talking finances. What are your expectations for Ms. Davenport? No, I expect to find a house okay to my specifications okay uh i would like uh communication as far as you know can she just communicate with you like whenever she feels comfortable is that okay no i mean whenever i have a question i want her to answer or be there to answer really oh yes you you want her to call you and give you updates? No, no. I want to call. I want, I want her to answer my calls. Oh. If I'm asking her a question or, or find she needs out to actually she, answer her phone. Huh? She needs to answer her phone. Well, yes. Wait a minute. Wait. wait. Hey, help me out here, Travis. Help me out here. He, he says he wants agents to answer their phones. How, how does that work? I don't know. They pick up the phone and say hello. <laughs> I've never done that in my life. Crazy. We haven't ever had that happen. Let me tell you, they have a way to come back, and then I'll go to the agent and say, "Why oh, did no. you call?" <laughs> the thing is, what I'm saying is, if you get what I'm saying, is that agents very rarely do what? Take Answer their phone. <laughs> they have what? They to rarely. They have like 50 listings, and they won't answer their phone. Yep. Literally. But go ahead, Mr. Eugene. Well, I want to answer the phone. I want. I have questions about this house and things that I'm looking to buy. But no, like, keep going. So okay. you want you expect her to communicate with you, right? What else do you uh, expect from her? Uh, do you want her to be proactive and actually try to find you houses, or do you, does she just need to sit around and just oh, no, twiddle no, her I fingers? Want her, I, I want her out looking for me a house. Oh, you want her to actually yes, work? Man. Okay. Yeah, I'm not. Y'all expect a lot now. Yeah. Expectations? That's, that's real. That's and just wait till you get licensed. You'll get everything changed. Yeah. <laughs> if you see what I'm saying is here is yes, you expect Miss Davenport to talk to you, mm -hmm. to send you listings, to go out and communicate with you, to also go and show you properties, to be professional, 
to act on your behalf and to negotiate on your behalf. These are the things you want. But you talk to Mr. Travis and Mr. Grossman and Mr. Aiden and myself, and we'll tell you. Huh, how many times it take us to call to finally get them to answer their phone? About 20? Just text everybody now. Yeah, texting basically works. They don't answer. They don't answer their phones. So that means I don't have to answer my phone no more? No, you get to answer your phone a lot. You're an office manager. That's different. different. Office managers have to answer their phone every single time. Yeah, different. But I didn't say it was almost seven days a week. Neither did I, but here we are. Here we are. So what happened? So, but yes, as y'all can see, is that real estate, of course, it's it's fun. I mean, it, it's got its ups and downs. But yes, we all, like I said, there's a lot of expectations. The key thing in this is that you do have requirements as real estate agents to look out for your client's interest, to make certain that your clients are happy, and that you also are not putting yourself first, you're putting your clients first. That's one of the saddest things is there's a lot of real estate agents that are out there, they work part time. And I can tell you, when I first started my brokerage, I thought it was okay for my agents to work part time. But as we've grown, I'm seeing day by day, it's very difficult for you to be a part time real estate agent and have multiple clients. Now I'm saying if you have one or two, it's possible. But if you've got five or more, you think it's possible to be doing this part time? Hell no. <laughs> no. Not at all. No. Yeah. Not at all. No. It is not easy to do this part time, guys and gals. You can love it. Yeah. It step, it step and knows. It is something that you have to work full time. Okay. It's something that you've got to do because let me tell you, your clients are going to call you like Travis and everybody said. They're going to call you 11 o'clock at night. 12 o'clock at night, they're going to expect you to answer that phone. Okay? If you don't set a strict schedule with your clients, they're going to eat your time up. I had to start doing that. I had to start telling my client, after about 8, 9 o'clock, do not text me. i got to have some downtime to relax. I will get back to you first thing in the morning. Because truthfully, after 5 o'clock, is there really anything I can do? No. Nope. If it's after 5 o'clock, you just gotta wait till the next day. Because no matter what you tell me, I probably can't get a hold of whoever I need to ask the question. That's right. Answer your question. So that's right. And I ain't gonna be able to show you a house after eight o'clock. No. Period. So if you need me, you gotta wait until after a certain time. You gotta lay those ground rules. Okay. But we expect you to be able to move stones. Don't you realize that? People. People think I can. I can work magic and move mountains. And let me tell you, it's very difficult. I've had, I've had, thank goodness for the, the help and all, but I've, I've made some things work, but it, it takes a lot. <clears throat> Y'all think as a real estate agent, it's difficult. Wait till your broker and you have about 20, 30 agents underneath you. One headache, one agent's job is, is horrible, right? All right, Stephen? Just use yourself as horrible. Try to multiply yourself 25 times, and then you get to be resolving every one of those people's no, problems. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. It will lead you to drink, I promise you. It's very stressful. And then you got an office manager that stresses you so oh, you know. Thankfully I get to look every night, I get to come to class and get to see Miss Leela and I get to see Miss Davenport. That's what it is. So that that makes my, my night. So I need y'all's phone numbers because that way I can get some relief. So but no, by all means, y'all, it is, it, it's, it's a hard process, but it's worth it. It's worth it. Okay. Uh, all right. So that finishes our first mic. We're done. It's finished. Our first one. Uh, if you have not gotten the, the Google Classroom link, please email me and I will get you the Google Classroom link. Most of you have it. I think I got everybody. But if you have not got it, send me an email and I will end up making certain that you're in the class. Okay? Other than that, we're going to call this a class tonight. We will pick back up tomorrow. Remember, we got two weeks. We're going to get through this. And then we just have the principal's classes and then we're done for the, for the first round of students.